Welcome to the fourth in our uh, Technology Empowered Conservation uh, uh, lecture series. We've just, um, the BCM class, we've just been discussing what we took out of uh, Alex Rogers' uh, lecture last week. I think some of you may have been here for that. He uh, was talking about um, basically the, this acoustic component and uh, the use of uh, open source conservation technologies, self build software uh, to do that. And we were discussing you know, sort of ripping off that lecture, how our understanding of open science had sort of expanded uh, from that. Previously, we've been thinking of open science as open access to academic journals, or um, uh, open access to data, or open access to source uh, coding. But I think what Alex really added last week was these two other dimensions of open access to build, the building of uh, sensors and, and conservation technologies, and then the notion of open collaboration, that actually it's becoming much easier to collaborate in this sort of uh, new science space, um, uh, new science space uh, we're in. So we'll be building on these, these themes um, in the rest of the, uh, of the lecture series. And we're going to have a slight change in direction for this lecture and the next uh, lecture. Whereas in the last three, we've really been looking at how Technology is enabling, empowering us to do new science relating to the study of natural things. You know, Alex Rogers on the, uh, on the oceans, the plastic tide studying uh, our litter. Fantastic tweet, by the way, from Sergio on that, if any of you would like to tweet and try and beat that one, but that's a little aside. And then last week, uh, we were doing the acoustic. Next week, we're going to have a look at, uh, we're talking about conservation culturomics. Uh, sorry, for these two lectures, we're going to be thinking more about how Data, computation, modelling and simulation is helping us to think in new ways about how to do policy and how to do more effective uh, conservation policy. Or conservation policy which is suited to the world we're living in and, and entering. So this week we're going to uh, focus on agent-based uh, modelling. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Adam Formica who's kindly stood in for Richard Bailey as you know, these have been swapped, uh, swapped around because of timetabling and travel clashes and so forth. I'm really pleased to have Adam here because he's, a, he's a, uh, what an emerging expert on uh, agent-based modelling. Adam is in his second year of his uh, PhD. He uh, comes from a field ecology background. He did uh, the biodiversity, the M MPhil version of the biodiversity conservation and management course. In when was it, Adam? 13, 14? 13, 14, yeah. 13, 14. Took a year off and now is in the second year of his, uh, of his DPhil. Working on agent based modelling for <coughs> policy demise. Demise? Demise. Hope not. Design. Sorry, I'm getting these yeah. right in a moment. Agent based <laughs> modelling for policy design. Thanks, Adam. Thank you for the. Introduction, Paul. Uh, I'll emphasize the emerging part. Uh, of emerging expert. Um, so, there we go. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is agent based modeling for policy design. Um, so, just an overview, I'll, I'll tell you why we do this in the first place. Um, I'll give an example of a really simple model so you know what it is I'm actually talking about, uh, and we'll get to see uh, what I mean by emergence. Um, and then we're actually going to go into a, a live demo of uh, a model I've been developing for my PhD. Um, and so, fingers crossed, that goes well. Uh, and then I'll walk you through some examples of other models uh, that are being built around the university um, with a conservation focus uh, to give you some of the ideas of, of how uh, these models are, are being deployed. Um, and so that'll be in the domain of fisheries. Uh, Paul's always saying they need more marine examples in the biodiversity conservation uh, course. Uh, we'll be talking about elephant poaching and wildlife management. Um, and then at the end, I'll give you some more resources that you can look at um, if you want to try this yourself, and then some contacts of the people who are behind uh, these models. So uh, let me just make sure I'm in presentation yeah, mode, which I'm not. Right. Yeah, cheers. This is distracted. Uh, all right. OK, so why do we do this? Well, ideally, we'd be doing randomized controlled trials, which are the gold standard uh, used in medicine. Uh, so what do I mean by that? We would have a policy in mind. We'd have a control group, and we'd have a treatment group. 
we implement the policy and we look at the difference between the two at the end of the trial. Now, a great example of this in conservation and one that I like that came out last year uh, for deforestation, which is more or less the topic of my PhD, uh, did this with different communities in Uganda. Um, so the control communities received no payment, whereas the treatment communities received a payment uh, to protect forests. And so not many of these kinds of studies get done in conservation. Um, there's a whole movement for evidence-based conservation led by Bill Sutherland and others, which you may have heard about in the course. Um, so what did the study find? Well, it found that if you pay people to protect forests, they do it. If you don't pay them, uh, deforestation is, is higher. And they determined this through uh, satellite uh, data looking at, at forest cover in, in these different communities. So this is the gold standard. Uh, but unfortunately, as I was alluding to, these cost a lot of money and they take a lot of time. So if you have different policies that you're throwing around thinking about implementing, uh, you can't run RCTs on all of them, randomized controlled trials. Um, and if you do have a policy, you may have different variations on that policy. So with the example of payments, you might vary the payment by a certain amount. And, and how is that going to affect the level of, of forest cover? Is it going to be linear? Is it nonlinear? You don't know until you conduct the trial. So what do we do in conservation and in other fields as well? Oftentimes we go with our best guess and we learn by trial and error. Um, and obviously this is not very efficient, um, but with limited funds, uh, it's, it's what you often, often have to do. Uh, so one of the solutions to this is that we can build simulations of the, the target system. Um, and we can test out the policies on that. So we have a, a virtual laboratory that we're testing in, uh, not a real world one. Um, and if our simulation is good, it's gonna represent uh, the characteristics of that target system. And this way we have some evidence to go on uh, when we're thinking about implementing different policies. So instead of just going through by trial and error, um, we have some sense from the simulation runs what the impacts of, of different policies are going to be. Um, and so an agent-based model is one type of simulation that I'll be talking about today. Um, but I guess this generally applies to, to other simulations as well. OK, so I'm going to explain agent-based models in pictures. They're very visual, um, which is an advantage of them. Uh, so an agent-based model starts with an environment. So what are you looking at here? A road, right? Um, so this is the environment which our, our agents operate over. Um, and then that environment is populated by different agents. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have cars. Um, so it's a very simple model. This is one of the canonical models in agent-based modeling um, is modeling traffic. Um, and so I'll get into conservation models later on, but this is just a simple one to, to introduce it. Um, so these agents, they follow certain rules, uh, they interact. Uh, so I've just highlighted a, a car here. Um, so an example of a behavior might be the car drives at a certain speed. Uh, if there's no car in front of it, it's going to speed up. If there's a car in front of it, it's going to slow down, etc. cetera. Um, if it interacts, uh, an example of that would be that it hits another car and it stops moving. Um, so we can see uh, a traffic jam actually develops, uh, which is what we observe in real life, and we capture in the simulation, which is a good sign. Um, so now that we have our simulation, we can test different policies on it. So one of the policies that we can test, I know this is really simple, but it's helpful, uh, is a speed limit. So why do we have speed limits? I actually didn't know this. I don't drive in the UK, um, but if we have a higher speed limit, we actually are more likely to get traffic jams. So the graph um, on the left here, you can look at time on the x-axis and speed on the y-axis, and that green line there is average speed. If you have a higher speed limit, that's what it looks like. If you have a slightly lower speed limit, um, you can see that the average is a little bit higher. But it, that's counterintuitive. If I tell you to drive slower, how do you go faster? It's because you don't get into traffic jams. Um, and so you can see on the right, the cars are uniformly distributed, driving at their speed, not colliding into each other. And then on the left, 
they're in a jam. So um, this is an example uh, of an emergent behavior. So we can easily describe the rules of the system, the individual agents, how they interact, um, but together they form a complex system so that systems evolving over time, uh, it matters where these agents are in space at certain times, so it's spatiotemporal. Um, and so that system may exhibit these emergent behaviors that we wouldn't necessarily predict when we were specifying the model. Um, and an example of that is traffic. Um, and then if we're testing out different policies, it may be hard to know what the effect of, of those might be too. Um, so I'm going to go into a demo here um, now that I've given you some background on agent-based modeling. And I'm going to talk about the one that I'm building. So I'm going to give you a verbal description, and then I'll give you the model itself, which will hopefully make a lot more sense. But I mentioned these features of an agent-based model, the environment, the agents, uh, their interactions, their behaviors. So it, um, my primary question in my DFIL is thinking about agricultural drivers of deforestation and the different policies that govern agriculture that could reduce pressure on forests uh, while still making agriculture a viable industry. Um, and so we know that growing food is our single biggest land footprint on, on the planet. So it uh, outnumbers the amount of hectares we use for cities or roads. Uh, so managing uh, how we grow food effectively uh, can, can leave space for uh, for nature. Um, so the environment that I have set up, um, I have roadways. Uh, the, the agents that populate my model, um, so I have farmer agents. Um, and these farms have certain attributes, uh, cost a certain amount of money to run your farm. Uh, a farmer has some level of income. And then that farm has some risk of uh, expanding into adjacent forest and causing deforestation. Um, and then I'm imagining a system where I have uh, spatially distributed farms and I have trucks that are going out to those farms to collect the crop from and bring it back uh, to mills. Um, and so these trucks have an operating cost, the fuel, for example, they have a certain capacity uh, for collecting fruit. Um, they, they might have a schedule they only collect from certain farms, etc. You can start to fill in the details. Um, and then these mills will, will process the, the crop and bring it to market, and that's going to increase uh, global profits for the aggregators. So you, I guess you have the farmers with their own income, but then you have a single aggregator entity that has a number of mills and then trucks that are collecting farms from, from or palm oil from the farms. Um, so some of the behaviors is that the farms are growing the palm oil, um, that palm oil will expire. I should also mention that I'm going to use the example of palm oil here, but this could be applied to other crops. Um, so the palm oil will expire. Um, these farms could expand, or they could go out of business, depending on their income level. Um, and the trucks are doing the purchasing. And then um, we have the processing uh, on the mill side of things. So now I'm going to actually show you what this model looks like. And I'll walk you through it. Uh, so that was hopefully the boring bit. Um, Let's get this guy up here. I think I have to actually exit presenter mode, so I'll do that. Make sure you can see what's on here. OK. Um, so what are you looking at? Um, on the right, you see a, a visual depiction of the model. So you can actually monitor it and how things are changing through time. On the left, you have various indicators. Um, so you can, you can choose to monitor certain things. Um, in the top left corner, uh, yeah, your top left corner, you'll see uh, the profitability. So I mentioned we want to uh, increase the sustainability of agriculture while still keeping it a viable industry. Um, so that's going to be one of the key things that we monitor. Uh, we can monitor other things. I have here uh, the plant capacity over time or the, a histogram of the crop levels on all the farms. Um, and so I'm going to just hit run here um, so you can see what's going on. Um, 
and then you can actually follow one of these truck agents around the map. Um, so what this one's doing is it's going around to different farms which are in red, uh, color coded by their, their level of risk. And it's turning, ah, oh, I just missed that. It's turning a different color when it's, it's full uh, and going back to the mill, which is in, in yellow. Um, and so we kind of reset the perspective here and just look, that process is playing out throughout this map. Um, and so I have real spatial data here on the, the distribution of plantations in a province in Malaysia. This is also the real road network. The mills are synthetic, but we can get uh, mill data from satellites as well. Um, you'll see these little Cs. This is from a previous iteration of the model that uh, trucks can only go to certain parts of the plantations that they have contracts with. Um, so this is the, the target system that I'm simulating. Uh, and now I'm going to try to poke it with these different policies and see what happens. Uh, so. This is the interactive part, because I'm going to ask you to make a prediction. I'm going to challenge you uh, to see what you think might happen uh, with a certain policy. Um, so one of the policies I have, uh, so I mentioned that these farms have a, a certain level of risk associated with them for expanding into adjacent areas and causing deforestation. And I'll reset this so you can just see what I mean by that. Um, you can see the farms are color-coded co color -coded according to the risk. So one thing I might do is reduce the level of risk I'm willing to take on as an aggregator in my supply chain. So I might say, I only want to go to farms with uh, in 80, maximum 85% risk. And, and we can see what might happen. Um, so, I'll challenge you in a second, um, but we'll just see what happens here by doing that. <coughs> this is the live part, which is always a little bit risky. Um, I just have to modify something here. <coughs> so I'm just going to ask you to keep an eye on that top right graph. Things seem to be good. Profits are going up. Um, let's see if they go up in a second here. One of the things I can do is speed up the model. I'm actually just going to rerun this here for a sec. And I'm not viewing updates. Oh, just for the clarification, you said 85% risk. Yep. What is the risk of? Um, the the risk is a oil palms are supplied. Uh, no, sorry, I should clarify. It's the risk of expanding into adjacent areas and uh, okay. causing deforestation. Okay, so now I'm going to say, what if I reduce my risk tolerance? So what if now I'm only going to those farms that are lighter in color? And I'll just show what the updated map looks like here. So you can see some of the farms have turned brown. They've gone out of business because they haven't been visited. So now I'm only going to route my trucks to those farms with a slightly lower risk. Do you think it's going to help my profits? Is it going to hurt my profits? Anyone want to venture? Any brave soul out there looking towards the front, maybe? It's probably my fault for not explaining the model well enough, so you don't have enough information to go on. If not, I'll just make a naive guess. Yeah, sure. I just have a question. Did you so there's nothing on the demand side, unfortunately. Um, so I, I'm just assuming that all the crop gets sold, that there's some demand for it. Um, so that's not included. So I just have farms growing the crop, aggregator collecting the crop, processing that, and sending it out. Is there anyone else? So just imagine these trucks. They're going to different locations. Some of those locations have higher risk. If I say you can't go to those locations anymore, that might affect profitability in some way. It's going to go down, right? That's what we think. So what's going to happen? I'm going to reduce my risk tolerance, and we can see what happens. So this was the easy one. The, the next one might be a little harder. But uh, I'll make a point with this. So uh, we can start to see one of the 
indicators here is plant capacity. But yeah, so profits start to go down because if we zoom in a little bit, these trucks are only going uh, to the lighter colored farms. So they're missing out on the, the palm oil that they could get by going um, to the farms with a higher risk. Now, this is pretty straightforward. Um, obviously, if you reduce risk, you're going to lower profits. But I just wanted to point this one out because it shows you that these policies are often on a continuous, uh, it's a continuous variable that you're affecting. And so what Asian-based modeling can do is uh, what might seem like an intuitive choice, it can tell you the, the optimal point to be on that uh, continuous variable, which in this case, if we go down to a risk tolerance of 70%, that's a little too conservative. Um, but if you are up at 85% where I started the model, um, you're still reducing risk by 15%, but it's the optimal level where you're reducing risk while still maintaining the viability of, of your agricultural enterprise. So I guess um, you could show this to someone uh, who is in agriculture and say, listen, you can still maintain the same level of profitability you have by reducing risk uh, by 15%. <coughs> so that was the point of that example. Um, so I'm just going to turn risk tolerance back up to 100% and these trucks can go to any farm. So I mentioned that you can control the scheduling of the trucks to different farms. Um, and so one of the things you can do is right now I have the trucks going to, to any old farm. Um, so it's going to uh, those farms with just a little bit of palm oil that's available to collect. So we can assume that maybe the farmer gets up on his mo mobile phone and he calls up the, uh, the mill operator and says, send me out a truck, I have some, some palm oil. So we just assume there's information going back and forth. So that's not necessarily explicitly captured in the model. Um, but then I might have an idea that I want to increase the efficiency with which I do agriculture, and I may only want to send my trucks to the farms with the most fruit, because I don't want to spend time going to the farms with not as much fruit. So. I'll show you the current current strategy, uh, which is that the trucks are going out to maybe anywhere on the map uh, with a little bit of fruit, and we can see our, our profitability is going up. Now I'm going to ask someone to guess what they think might happen if we send the trucks to those farms with the most fruit. Mm -hmm. Do you think? So you can start to play these games with the model like this. So you can have different policies in mind. And you can think, what's going to happen if I implement them? And then you can actually test these things in advance without actually having to put money behind the idea. So does anyone have an idea? Do you think, is, is it going to help the efficiency of agriculture if we're only sending trucks to farms with the most crop? What would we need to the cost of the fuel involved in doing too many journeys with too few fruit, though, or does that not a, a variable that we need to um, So I do have some cost in there. Uh, and so I guess the, the cost is going to be constant between both scenarios. So that's not going to be changing. But cost does have something to do with it because um, there is journey time involved. Mm -hmm. So it might take longer to get to certain farms with more fruit, which is kind of a hint of what might happen. Um, but the rotting, I mean, if, if the truck is picking up fruit, it may have to, if it has to travel longer distances. Right, yeah. Rot on the way to market, or like the quality also of the fruit that they're picking up. So we don't model quality, but quality is also an important part of this, yeah. Because I guess there's a 24 hour window with palm oil <coughs> when you process it, uh, or for processing from the fresh fruit bunch. But yeah, that's a very good point. You have to go farther, um, and that could affect things. Does anyone want to say either way? Is it going to go up or down? No one wants to. It's going to go down? Oh. oh, all right. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything. So anonymous voices in the crowd, or at least to me. You, I guess you know your classmates' voices. But um, So I'll just change it. So now this is pretty extreme, but the trucks are only going to the farms with that are in the top 5% of those with the most palm oil. So we're now only sending trucks to the farms with the most fresh fruit bunches to collect. And we can watch what happens. It may take a second. But it's not going up anymore. It's actually starting to go down. 
So what's what's maybe happening? So we can inquiry our model and we can see what's going on here. So I, I just paused it, by the way, which you can do. You can also change things midway through. And so see how these all these ones are together now? Because they're all going to the same farms. And uh, what's happening is that the trucks are going very far across the map to these few farms with the most fruit. And uh, they're stripping all the fruit from that farm. And it takes a long time for them to go to and fro. Whereas if they just went to any old farm in their local vicinity, uh, that's actually more efficient. Um, and so if we just reverse this, so all the trucks don't mob on the same farms and we go back, uh, we can see depending on how far we are, because also some of the farms go out of business, so it might be at this point, it's a point of no return. Um, so I actually won't, won't continue that uh, to reverse it, but you can see how uh, we may have thought that they might go up, or at least Paul did. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we don't know until we test it. Um, so we can have hypotheses about the system, and then we can interrogate the system to test our hypotheses. Um, in a way that I wouldn't be able to do because I don't own a palm oil aggregation business in Malaysia. But I can, from Oxford, talking to people who know about this system, uh, convert that system into code and then simulate that system and, and just verify that system matches uh, what someone might anticipate and then start to test things that they may not know about. Um, so that's the gist of... Um, what Asian based bottling is about. Um, so let's go back into the presentation here. Um, so I guess one of the things that I should, I, I should also say is that there is some uh, timing and parameter sensitivity. So when I did certain things matters. Um, and what I set the parameter is, is it 0.7 or 0.85? So uh, there can be quite a bit of sensitivity with these models, which is maybe one of the weaknesses um, just to be aware of um, in case some of you are a little skeptical because I already had the settings in advance that I planned to show you to get the behaviors that I want, right? Um, but I'm just gonna put this graph up here, which illustrates uh, why it's advantageous to, to plan in advance using these types of simulation tools. So on the x-axis, you're looking at time. On the y-axis, you're looking at profitability. Um, and so the blue curve is our naive trial and error approach. Um, so I, I walked you through two possible policy options. Um, the first was to visit uh, low-risk farms and, and be conservative, and we saw the profits dipped a little bit again. Um, and then we reversed that policy, and, and profits started to go up. And then I said, uh, we're going to try and increase fuel efficiency um, by only visiting the, the best farms or the farms with the most fruit. Uh, and that actually hurt us and profits went down. And then we reversed that policy and they started to go up again and so on and so forth. Um, and then, so that's the blue curve. That's the naive trial and error approach. And then the orange curve is if we already knew in advance those were poor policies. And so if you just simply take the integral of these two curves and make a ratio um, so the area under the curves, you can see that our, our profits over time, it's, it's a seven-fold increase from knowing in advance uh, that these policies weren't going to help us. Um, so we, we save resources uh, in a sense. Um, so uh, just to make the connection to conservation, one of the things that I was testing here is, is deforestation risk and how would we reduce that and convince um, uh, an agricultural operator that it's in their interest they, they can do it without hurting their bottom line. Um, and then the fuel efficiency is a little more tricky uh, because I guess in theory, if you're more fuel efficient, you can grow the same amount of crop with less lag because less of the fruit is, it, say, expiring or going to waste. Um, but if you increase the efficiency, you may increase the incentive depending on the demand uh, to expand into more areas. So if you do have adequate protection in the areas around um, and you're, you're increasing yields, uh, then you can reduce pressure on forests. So just to clarify that. Um, 
And then I'm just going to show you a web version uh, that I've been developing with others. I mean, I've done almost none of the work on this. Um, but just how we're trying to get these tools into the hands of decision makers. Um, so I'll just close the presentation again really quick. Um, so obviously, as researchers, uh, we can test out all of these different things. Um, but as policymakers, they may not have the time or the patience to go through all the different parameter settings. Um, and so uh, one of the things we can do here is uh, we can just summarize. So we can have a set of scenarios, which I have in this drop down menu. Um, so this is the scenario where uh, we're sending trucks, say, to the top farms, and we see on the bottom right that the profit curve is bending down, and that's not the best strategy. Um, I have the plantations represented. I'll just zoom in a little bit. Here in, in green, you can see the seasonality of the crop growing. That was masked by the risk before. Um, and then in yellow, you have mills, and then these trucks that are going out in red. Um, and you could show them this and say, look at what happens to your profits if your trucks do this. Um, and then you could then go to the, the intervention solution and, and play that, and then look at how profitability changes through these two scenarios without actually having to go through all the different parameter values with them as I, I did with you. Um, and then uh, just to sort of, again, drive it home, um, we can have a scenario where we're maybe too conservative so we can look at um, the risk as well as the, the fruit and we can sort of toggle in between that. And that's one of the limitations with NetLogo. I'm not able to change what I'm representing in the cells dynamically. Um, I might be able to with certain functions, but I guess this would be easier for someone to use. Um, so in this case, they're only going to the lightest farms here with the, the lowest risk and the, the profit curve bends down. And then we can look at um, our intervention uh, scenario where uh, it doesn't bend down quite as much and then these these trucks are going to the the areas with slightly more risk. So that's just an example. What is the time frame? The, the time frame on this, um, we have it calibrated to how long it takes to get to a plantation, so a single trip for a truck. Um, so, I mean, I, it's sort of on days to weeks uh, that we're simulating here, but can be adjusted. So this is still... So in the graph, those days, hours... Uh, so th I guess on the x-axis, which is currently unlabeled, sorry about that, uh, in development, but um, <laughs> is, uh, you can imagine them as days maybe. Yes. So this is looking over the course of a year, what happens to your, your profits and kind of the medium term. Um, so that's kind of a, a sidebar, but anyway, just wanted to show you um, how some of these uh, tools might be used uh, in practice. Um, so. To, to wrap up, because I'm close to done here, I really have been talking for about 30 minutes. So um, I'm just going to show you some other models. Uh, and these will be very brief, so I won't walk through in, a, in the way that I did. Um, uh, people around Oxford. Uh, so just going clockwise, I'll show you fisheries first. Um, so Ernesto, who's working with Richard Bailey, who couldn't be here today, um, who I'm speaking in the place of. Um, and our coupled uh, human environment systems group. Uh, so a core part of that is fisheries. Um, and then Emily Neal, who's an ex-BCM student, uh, she did BCM last year, and she uh, actually did her BCM master's on elephant poaching. Uh, and she built her own Asia-based model uh, that came out very well, so I wanted to display that too. And then um, we just have James at the bottom there who's working with Wild Crew. He's actually in Ethiopia right now. Um, and he had very poor internet connection, but was able to send me through his model. Uh, so I'll show you that as well. Um, so I'm pretty excited uh, to, to be sharing these and I'm grateful that, that they were able to pass them on. So just for fisheries, uh, here we have a coast that's represented. Um, we have a port, uh, which, which is that little anchor. Um, and then in this model, I'll just uh, run it here. So I'm actually going to have to get out of presentation mode, it looks like, to run it. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully you can still see it. Yeah, you can still see it. OK. Um, so he's just showing you the different layers. So he has species <coughs> under there. And then these different boats are going out and fishing. And there are two classes of boats. Um, you have 
and I'll play this again, but you have black boats, which are small boats, blue boats, which are larger ones. The black boats are constrained because they're smaller fishers. They don't have the resources to buy the fuel to go farther afield to catch fish. Um, and so you can actually see that in this model um, when he swaps back to fish stocks. Uh, you can see that semicircle that's completely white because all the boats fish around port. And then the larger ones in blue you can see are farther off um, are able to go and, and get the fish farther away. Um, and so uh, we can look and see what would happen um, in the absence of any policy, which uh, is unsurprising, I guess. Uh, it would be that we're going to fish this, the stock to its um, demise. Uh, and I'll just, because I'm going to play a few more videos, uh, stay on this mode. Um, but one of the policies that we could implement is a, a quota. So any of you who know about fisheries would know that you can have one type of quota that's a total allowable catch. Um, but the problem with this type of quota is I mentioned that the small boats can't go out as far. Um, so the big boats end up benefiting. They get the largest share of the quota. Um, so all the fish stocks get fished out around port and the small boats can't continue to fish. And then the remaining part of the quota is made up by the larger boats going farther out and catching those fish. Um, so this isn't great from an equality standpoint. Uh, you want to make sure that small fishers have a livelihood as well. Um, so you can introduce a, a tradable quota. This might solve things. So the small fishers, even though they can't go out, they can trade with bigger ones and they can um, more efficiently allocate the quota to make sure they benefit. But you can see here, um, so again, I didn't make these graphs, but uh, uh, time is on the x-axis, it's very small. And then you have the, the profits of these two classes on the y-axis. In orange are the big boats, and then in green are the, the small boats. Um, and it's pretty difficult to see with the contrast, at least for me, but what I'm trying to show between these two graphs is that the line doesn't change very much, which is perplexing, right? Because these boats should be able to trade quotas. Um, what actually happens is that the way they have the model set up is the smaller boats are only to willing to trade um, for more money than they could make fishing otherwise. So at first this is great because there's fish available and they're only willing to sell the quota at a high amount to the larger boats. But then what happens is those larger boats also fish around port and eventually there's no fish left to catch within the zone where the small fishers uh, operate. And they're in a very weak bargaining position because the big boats know they can't fish anything. And so they um, drive down the price and say, I'll give you uh, cents to use your quota. And the, the small boat effectively has to say yes, because I mean, it's, it's marginally better uh, than what they could get otherwise, which is nothing. Um, so that's why in the beginning, um, it's a little bit better, but then ends up being just as bad. So one of the clever solutions that Richard's group was able to, to show is that you can actually set up, you can combine policies by setting up a protected area in your port. And you can say only the small fishers can operate near port um, and the larger ones have to go farther afield. And I'll just show you what happens with the model. And what's great about Asian-based models is that they're so visual, you can see the impact of the policy. So this gray area here is a marine protected area around the, uh, the port there, uh, which is in black. And so, if we run this, you can see species there. And then it's the last part. So you'll notice that the blue boats aren't fishing in, in that zone. They can traverse it, but they can't uh, extract fish from there. So if we run this for a little bit, this is really interesting because you see an outline of the protected area because um, the small boats can't go to the extremities of the protected area. But there's actually some fish around port. So if you remember before, I showed you a white semicircle. So all the fish stocks were fished out. But then if, if you maintain some of the fish stocks, that means that there's still some value to fish around port. And then when you're trading the quotas, um, the small boats will sell it for a reasonable price. Um, and so they um, aren't left uh, just selling the quotas for pennies. Um, and that's actually what's what I was showing you previously in this graph. So it still doesn't do a whole lot. Um, it's not that these two lines are equal, but if you compare that uh, line on the bottom 
um, to the dotted lines, which are very faint uh, below that, uh, you can see that it's, it's slightly higher. So these are some of the policies that we can test out with fisheries management. It's a great example of how you have heterogeneous agents in the state, small boats and large boats uh, that interact with the geography of the system um, and in the policies that we implement within that system. So this is the complex system with properties that are, that are hard predict, to predict. So um, it makes sense when you're explaining it after the fact, uh, but it can be difficult to, to plan uh, in advance. Um, so moving right along, uh, this is Emily's model of uh, elephant poaching. Um, and she went into a lot of detail uh, representing aspects of the elephant's biology. So she has herds of elephants with males and females and matriarchs and adolescents going off from the herd. I know very little about elephants, but, um, and she also has uh, with age, the tusk size of the elephant. And then um, if you see in yellow up there is a village and she'll simulate poachers coming out of that village and catching uh, the elephants and, and taking the tusks and being remunerated uh, according to the size of the tusk. And so she built this model of an elephant poaching system to test out different uh, management strategies. So how do we zone the, po uh, the rangers, for example? Do we concentrate them in a smaller area in one core zone? Do we distribute them across the map? What about the scheduling of these rangers? Do we have them out every day of the week? Do we have them out sometimes? Um, and so she, she did something clever in here, which was she didn't actually have, and I'll play the model just so you can see it run, um, poaching agents, but you see these four quadrants. Um, she had a probability of catching an elephant, uh, catching a poacher in one of the quadrants. So you could evenly distribute that probability across all four quadrants, or you could just say it's high in only one quadrant. Um, and that could be the evenly dispersed versus concentrated approach to where you allocate your rangers. And then she also said um, you can only get caught for a certain interval in certain quadrants. So then you could simulate rangers being out only for a shorter period of time. And then you can actually overlay those things so you can change the probabilities in different quadrants and then change how long uh, rangers would be out for. So um, quite a lot, of, uh, a lot of detail and insight to be gained from that. And then um, just this is the last model I'll show you. You're probably getting sick of these by now, but hopefully um, I'm touching on different interests. This is more of a, what I would call an individual-based model. Uh, there's no a sensible difference with an Asian-based model, but individual-based models are, uh, there's a history of them in uh, biology. So modeling individual trees in a forest, for example. In this case, we have the Ethiopian gray wolf, um, which is a critically endangered species. Um, and I think there's only 500 left, James was telling me. And they interact with dogs. And the problem with that is dogs carry rabies. And those rabies spread to the wolves. And uh, there are different management strategies to vaccinate the dogs, for example, to indirectly protect the wolf population from rabies. So he has a model of the wolf packs and the dog packs interacting in space and through time. Um, and so in this case, he, he doesn't vaccinate any of them. And uh, you can see it's a little difficult, but on this graph here, um, this is the number of outbreaks that it's going up. Um, and then you'll see the number of individuals is dropping here. So we might think uh, maybe we're going to vaccinate some of the dogs. Um, how is that going to affect the wolf population? Uh, it's looking like the scenario is pretty much the same. Uh, there's still the same number of outbreaks when you introduce rabies. Um, but then if you vaccinate both the wolves, a proportion of the wolves and the dogs, um, you can see here there's an outbreak, but it doesn't quite spread. Um, so enough of them have been inoculated against rabies to maintain the population numbers if there's an outbreak. Um, so I think now I can switch back to presenter mode because I have no more videos for you. Um, but he uh, ran these models multiple times because the outcomes are stochastic. Uh, so he averaged across model runs. And you can just see on the far right, if you have no management, um, you have the most number of outbreaks. If you vaccinate some of the dogs, it's a little bit better, but not statistically significant, according to him. And then if you look at the wolf and dog vaccination uh, outcome, it's lower um, than no management. So this is just an example of, of how this is being applied. 
for wildlife management as well. So you don't have to have necessarily a human component. Um, I guess there is some with the, the vaccination part, but it's mostly biology. Um, and lastly, I just want to point you to some more resources. So maybe this interested you. Um, I hope maybe a few of you. Uh, and uh, most of this uh, had, has been done with the exception of the fisheries model in a, a programming language called NetLogo, um, which is very uh, simple to use. There are many languages you can start out with, but I would advise you to use this one because there's the most documentation uh, to get you going. Uh, it's free, it's open source, um, and they have some tutorials that you can look at. Um, and what I find really helpful are examples of other models that people have built. So I showed you four, but there are hundreds out there that you can look at. And um, the Modeling Commons is one of those places, uh, so you can look at uh, other examples of models. So it may be that you find one that's suitable for your system, and then you can modify it uh, with certain policies that you might want to in implement so you don't have to build from the ground up. Um, and then OpenABM is, is another source. Um, so these are some good pages. And then I'm just going to leave you with this slide. Um, these are contact details going clockwise. I don't look like that anymore, but I'm on the bottom left. But Ernesto, Emily, and James. Um, and I think, yeah, put their emails here and who they are uh, and what group they're associated with and sort of broadly what they're working on. Um, so with that, thanks for your attention. Yeah, um, and I'm happy to field any questions or however Paul wants to run. Yeah. Well, thanks very much.